Good morning. Welcome to Christ Church Kerrville, uh, both those of us who are gathered here in person and those gathered at home. We are so glad that you would join us uh, today. If um, this isn't your regular church home and you're new here, we'd love for you to fill out um, a visitor card, although I say that, um, it says on the back of your bulletin. So under the benediction line, you can write your name and um, tear it off and drop it in the um, offering as we go by, but we are uh, so glad that you're here with us this morning. Um, I wanted to point out uh, those of us who are regular attendees here probably received uh, an email from Billy relative to these fun masks um, that uh, we get to wear and just want to um, encourage us all to um, have these on, uh, certainly when we're up and about and when we're singing, when we're, um, when we're seated and listening to the sermon, you feel free to uh, pull them down and um, listen and focus. But other than that, uh, it's just a, a way to love each other uh, and care for each other and make everybody feel comfortable. So thank you for, uh, for doing that. Um, there are offering baskets. Um, you'll see one here and one back here. Um, if you choose to make a, a contribution to the church, you can just drop it in there at any point uh, throughout the morning. And I uh, want to just make note of, uh, we have our friend, um, Brune Stacy is here. He will be preaching uh, here in a moment. He leads RUF at uh, Rice University in Houston, so he's very, very smart. Um, <laughs> but we're, we're glad that he's here with us. He's been here before knows Kerrville well, uh, parents are here in the community, and so we're really glad to have uh, Brune with us. If you'll take notice uh, in your bulletin, uh, there is a quote uh, and a verse from Galatians. Just wanna give you time, a few moments of silence to prepare your heart and minds for worship uh, before I uh, call us back for the call to worship. Would you please stand and join me in our call to worship as it's printed in our bulletin. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. The Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. Would you pray with me? Father God, as we gather this morning, um, I ask that you would slow us down. Uh, speak clearly and directly to our hearts. Uh, some of us are here this morning with grand plans for making uh, changes in our lives. Some of us, no doubt, are here feeling tired and uh, beat up from the past few months. But in whatever state we're here, I pray that this morning as we gather to bring you worship, that we will slow down, that we will offer all that we are, all of our hopes and our dreams, our hurts and regrets, uh, to you as our spiritual act of worship. And may our offering of worship bring you glory. Amen. Good 
Good morning. Please join in singing us today. I recently uh, read a quote which said this, it's not that a God has a mission, but rather God's mission has a church. And uh, that's a great statement and really a startling truth that we are the conduits of God's mission among his people. Uh, But I, I don't know about you, I oftentimes don't feel worthy of that role and that's because I'm not and neither are you. But the beauty is that in spite of our unworthiness, God chooses to use us to fulfill his mission. But often I think uh, the danger is that we become so inoculated with the Christian life that, well, I'll speak for myself, I actually start believing that in fact I am a worthy bearer of God's mission and I can accomplish it only uh, under my power. 
But scripture tells us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And this morning we indeed are still sinners. Nonetheless, Christ died for us and chose to work through us to fulfill his mission. And it's important uh, in the midst of that that we pause and take stock of our own lives, those areas in which we fall short of worthiness to fulfill the mission of God. And so uh, let's take notice of the call to confession. Uh, I will read this portion uh, from the book of Joel, and then we'll respond together, after which we'll take a few moments uh, of silence for personal confession. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Gracious Father, we confess our sins, we repent of your idolatries, Please bring us out of our darkness into your great light. Give us the courage to admit the profound depravity of our desires, thoughts, and actions. Grant us the humility to embrace our weaknesses and acknowledge our inabilities. Soften our hearts to love what you love. Soften our wills to follow your way and not our own. Help us to abide in the spirit of Jesus Christ who is our comforter and our counselor. Replace our unbelief with faith in the one who is the light of the world, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you stand and join with me uh, together in response as we are assured of the gospel? Beloved, this is the message we have heard from God and now proclaim to one another. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. To those who repent and look to Jesus Christ for their salvation, the forgiveness of sins is effected in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, open our lips. And our mouths will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. Amen. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Psalm, uh, Psalm 132, 1 through 12. Remember, O Lord, in David's favor, all the hardships he endured, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, I will not enter my house or go into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Behold, we heard of it in Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of Jar. Let us go to this dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let your saints shout for joy. For the sake of your servant David, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and my testimonies that I shall teach them, their sons also forever shall sit on your throne. Would you pray with me? Father God, we're thankful that we're able to come together and worship this morning during these past few months, more than any other time, perhaps, we've learned to not take corporate worship for granted. So God, uh, this morning we pray for those that are not able to gather and worship this morning. Those that are sick, those that live in unsafe places, those who for whatever reason feel unwelcomed or unworthy, be with them that they may know your peace. We pray for other churches in Kerrville and beyond that are gathering now in places of worship, in homes, online. We pray that however we meet as a church that we may still be a clear beacon of hope for your love in our communities, that we may be uh, indeed able to live out your mission Father, strengthen our pastors and church leaders. Grant us favor in our communities and give us boldness to love as Christ loves. Uh, We pray for our leaders across the state and the country. And we ask that during these times, especially that they would seek your guidance, that your love and grace would influence their leadership in such a way that our communities become whole. Lastly, God, we pray for families and households throughout our country and communities to be places in which you are welcomed, that families would love and live as manifestations of your love for them. We pray all these things, uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, um, I uh, covered the announcements at the beginning. I went out of order. Um, we're going rogue here. Uh, but I didn't cover the passing of the peace. And so we will do that. Um, I, I, uh, I would guess that means we like text the peace to each other or something. <laughs> but you can give fist bumps and elbow bumps and um, Take a moment. to do that. And then we will, we will uh, gather back together again. But let me be the first to do that. The peace of Christ be with you. Amen. Amen. Christ to you all. Kathy. Bless him. Peace to Christ, Kathy.
please join with us in singing again. My Lord, I did not choose you, for that could never be. My heart would still refuse you, had you not chosen me. You took the sin that stained me, and cleansed me It is a privilege for me to be back, and I say that in all earnestness. Uh, this is as close to a home game away from home as I get uh, with so many friends and family here, and it was a privilege for me to be here. I was here a little over a month ago, and uh, it was a treat. That was my first time. Being back here a month ago was probably the first time I had been in corporate worship for the better part of three months. Uh, my church, our church home in Houston, is still meeting uh, almost exclusively online. So I really counted a privilege to be able to sing, uh, to be at the Lord's table, and to hear uh, from his word this morning. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and flip to Galatians chapter 4. Uh, it, it's a privilege for me, I guess, to interrupt uh, all the continuity that you had with Billy and the life of David and the Psalms, and he gave me the freedom to kind of interject right in the midst of that. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. But this is a text that I find myself coming back to uh, time and time again. As now I'm uh, working with college students, as mentioned at Rice, uh, I know this will a text that I come back to time and time again. So if you've got a Bible, Galatians chapter 4, we'll be in verses 12 through 20. Uh, but I want to catch you up a little bit on the context that may be helpful. So for the first three chapters of this letter, uh, Paul is doing all of his best work to untie all these little false teaching tendrils that are weaving their way into this church that he loves. Uh, there are some local Judaizers who are wanting to say to this innocent young group of relatively new Christians that the way forward is actually the way backward. You've got to add all these 
mosaic laws and dietary restrictions and cultish practices on top of your free justification in Jesus. And Paul is, with all of the uh, weapons at his disposal, pushing back on that. Um, and so, so much through the first three chapters, he's using uh, examples from the Old Testament. He's going back and reminding them of Abraham, justified by grace. Uh, he gives examples of Sarah and Hagar. He's walking through uh, redemptive history, right? He's kind of using uh, all the white-hot logic he can to pull them back, to get them disenchanted from these groups that are wanting to pull them away. And by the time we get to this section, uh, you're going to notice a shift. Uh, for three chapters, he's been kind of guns blazing, but the tone changes here. And it gets very personal, and it gets very pastoral. He kind of flips his hat from theologian proper to now just the picture of this broken-hearted, bleeding-hearted pastor in front of people that he loves dearly and, and desperately. It's going to be unbelievably personal, so follow along with me. Just eight verses this morning. Galatians 4, starting in verse 12. I beg you, brothers and sisters, to become like me, because I have become like you. You have done me no wrong, but you know it was because of a physical illness that I first proclaimed the gospel to you. And though my physical condition put you to the test, you did not despise or reject me. Instead, you welcomed me as though I were an angel of God, as though I were Christ Jesus himself. Where then is your sense of happiness? For I testify about you that if it were possible, you would have pulled out your eyes and given them to me. So then have I become your enemy by telling you the truth. They, these Judaizers, court you eagerly, but for no good purpose. They want to exclude you so that you would seek them all the more eagerly. However, it is good to be sought eagerly for a good purpose at all times, and not only when I am present with you. My children, I am again undergoing birth pains until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be with you now and change my tone of voice because I am perplexed about you. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Um, Lord, I thank you for this text that teaches me and exposes the ways in which I am indifferent and exposes the ways in which I uh, trample on the power of your good news and your gospel, which is a power unto salvation for the whole world. Uh, across time and place, Jesus, I pray even in this time we have together now that you would be seen more clearly, that we would enjoy you and walk out of this place as a corporate body more in love with you and your mission in the world than when we came in. Uh, Holy Spirit, I pray you would make it so for the beautiful name of Jesus. We pray all these things. Amen. Okay, this morning, I just want to walk through what I see Paul, like a very skilled surgeon with the heart of these people he loves, trying to apply the gospel in power in all of their relationships. Nothing is off the table, so to speak. I think Paul is going to point out, and I hope that you get to see it, the gospel changes the way that we think about power in every relationship that you have. And I hope that that is clear by the time we're done. But it's not just that, that the gospel changes uh, the scope and the intensity of all of the relationships that you're already in. That God is doing something through the gospel to you. Uh, as the Puritans might say, there's some passions he is putting in you by virtue of the power of what God is doing in the gospel. And lastly, I think he finishes by pointing out how the gospel has changed all the motives in his own relationships with this church and by extension of this church to the world. But first and foremost, how does the gospel change power, the workings of power in relationships? Look back at the beginning. It almost seems prideful for Paul to say, become like I am, right? That seems prideful at the outset. It's the very first imperative. It's the, it's the first thing any Galatian is asked to do in the whole book. For, for three chapters, he's been kind of downloading content. And now the only thing he's asked them to do, he says, become like me, become like I am. But he tethers it, if you noticed, because. Why? What reason? Because I have already become like you. What does that mean? There's a, a number of theories. If, uh, when you go all the way back and study any nature of any relationship in any culture across history, uh, I, I had the privilege at UT 
Uh, my family let me dabble in psychology, which uh, was still not a real major for me at the time. Uh, I feel like I know a little bit about a lot of things, and that's about it. But uh, there's all kinds of theories as to how relationships work, right? What, what causes you to become or be in a relationship with people like you, um, unlike you, all kinds of theories, not a lot of answers. Uh, one theory I remember, you might be familiar with the name um, Abraham Maslow. He was a humanist psychologist in the 60s. And his theory was, um, as long as your needs are satisfied, if you're not hungry and if you feel safe and secure, uh, you will now extend a, a, an arm of fellowship or kindness to somebody else, right? It's only when your needs are met first, you kind of get self-power uh, first, and then you can kind of care about uh, someone else, right? And there's all kinds of other theories. Uh, you could probably settle your own. But I do think it's not an overstatement to think through the ways in which, maybe even subconsciously, there's elements of power in the dynamics of the relationships you have, right? You might choose to uh, network with a certain individual by association as apart from other individuals because you think it's going to give you a leg up, right? It's going to give you some influence, uh, some power, some authority that without you wouldn't, right? You could join a, a guild or an association, right? If they're kind enough to let you in to extend you some power and then that gives you some power and networking and business and relationships, right? Uh, we kind of laugh at it now, but uh, it, it's kind of fawned upon to marry somebody for money and security now. We laugh about that. But for most of human history, that's just what you did, right? If you were a, a Bedouin tribe in the Middle East and uh, you saw a groom who's going to pay you a dowry and give your daughter some security, that's just what you did, right? So you can see there's just power being given and exchanged in all these relationships all the time. And one of the interesting things when you think about a guy like Paul, if you remember, go back to Philippians chapter 3. You don't have to turn to it, but you'll remember it, right? He lists his um, Judaism curriculum vitae, right? If you, if you want to play the game of who's more Jewish and the alpha Hebrew, you're going to lose, right? Uh, he is born in the right tribe, right? He is circumcised on the eighth day. He has all of the advantages of the best of that school, right? He is uh, from the right side of the tracks. He is going to the best uh, postgraduate rabbinic schools, right? He is on his fast track to the Talmudic Hall of Fame, Mount Rushmore of Judaism, right? Zealous to beyond compare. And in Philippians 3, he says he shed all of that to now spend time trembling in sickness and weakness, uh, endearing himself to a community of nowhere people, of people who can offer him nothing. He traded all of it. You might be familiar with the name um, Henry Nowen. He was a kind of a Catholic spiritualist, pastor, writer, author. He's from the Netherlands. He was born in the 30s, but uh, found his way here to the U.S. Uh, to Notre Dame. Uh, got an undergrad, Ph.D. He taught at Yale, Harvard Divinity School, um, whatever, again, kind of curriculum, vitae, tenure track, he was there. And after about 20 years of teaching, uh, he penned this while he was on a sabbatical. He said, after 25 years of priesthood, I found myself praying poorly, living somewhat isolated from other people, and very much preoccupied with burning issues. I woke up one day with the realization that I was living in a very dark place, and that the term burnout was a convenient psychological translation for a spiritual death. So in 1985, he resigns from his tenured track position at Harvard, and he takes a position in Ontario, Canada, with a community called the La Arche, which was a small group of Christians devoting themselves to care for the needs of uh, entirely handicapped and disabled individuals. Small, 15, 20 people. So what in the world would make a, a power exchange for a man like Henry Nowen or a man like Paul to give up everything they had to go serve individuals that can give them nothing in return. That is shocking. That would shock me. It still shocks me. <clears throat> and you find uh, another example of this even in Paul's own more explicit outline, 1 Corinthians 9. Though I'm free from all, I made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. 
I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessing. The gospel, the very power of God, has this upside-down component. Paul and Henry now are not inventing something. They're being compelled because they've seen it in Jesus, right? Who has given up everything, the only one who had real power of anything, to give it up for those who don't really have any power, right? There is this unbelievable exchange. And I think Paul is so worried that the Galatians will miss that in their own lives. And by extension, that applies to us. And so the question that I have been wrestling with through this text is an assessment of my own relationships. How is power being used and stewarded in the relationships that I have? Are you seeking to give away influence and power to those who don't have it, uh, who may not even need it, because of the fullness that you have in Jesus? Who are the individuals that you have missed or passed by or forgotten or ignored, not because they can add anything to your bottom line, your influence, your authority, but because of what you have in Jesus that you would, by extension, give away to them? The answer to that question demonstrates what you believe about the power of the gospel. Again, because it's not your eloquence, as we'll see here in a minute. It's not going to be your perfect words. Your status, right? If you believe, like Paul, that you can even in weakness and a bodily ailment, God can use you, then you can give away power like Jesus. And you could have the confidence, like Paul could say to somebody, become like I am. Follow me as I follow Christ. That's a hard statement for us to say unless we're very aware of our weaknesses and God's power right? at the same time. So it's not just that the gospel changes the power dynamics of every relationship that you're in, but it also changes the scope and the intensity of these relationships. Look at uh, verse 15 again and 18. Look at the adjectives that Paul uses in this description of this relationship. For I testify to you, he says, if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Now, there may be a a wordplay here. Some some commentators think Paul may have had this kind of degenerative eye condition, so he's kind of playing that with them, but I think at the end of the day, what the point he's making is that the Galatians were going to give what was most valuable to them back to him, right? The thing that was most precious, they were wanting to give back originally. He goes on to say, verse 18, it was always good to be made much of for a good purpose and not only with you. Verse 19, my little children, for whom I am in anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now, for I'm perplexed. This is, a, this is a picture of a pastor's anguishing, burdened, bleeding heart for these people that he so desperately loves. He's, he's rebuked them and chided them and admonished and used in every sharp-tongued word he can to call them back for three chapters. And after all of that, he still is endearing. He still is saying, my little children, my brothers and sisters, those who I love dearly, the, the most painful and intimate and excruciating relationship between a mother giving birth to a child is the only analogy that Paul can say applies because of the nature of the scope of these relationships. There's such intimacy now between Paul and this church. The only analogy I can pull from is that of the most intimate child rearing, right? And, and there's, a, there's some mixed metaphors. There's kind of a switched metaphor here, but... Paul is saying that these these Galatians that are being teased out by these Judaizers, that their kind of flirtation with this false doctrine is causing the the anguish of childbirth in him. He feels the pain of that, right? They don't feel anything. That's the problem. He feels that like a mother giving birth, the tremors he feels deep in his own soul, right? That's how painful and loving the scope of these relationships have become. And Paul knows something of the unbelievable love and patience of Jesus when he was at the zenith of his own zeal and uh, crucifying and murdering Christians and the patience of God waiting for him so he can be patient with a law-loving church. He can be zealous and patient at the same time with them. But this anguish in Paul, I think, uh, highlights, and this is for us too, a key difference. How, How do you know whether or not what you're hearing is false teaching or false doctrine. And I think this contrast 
speaks to that. Paul is weeping and crying out in labor for Christ to be formed in them, and these false teachers only want their own teaching to be propped up in the lives of these individuals. That's all they care about is themselves. So let's, let's apply this for a moment in terms of the anguish that Paul is feeling. There was a, a New York Times study done in the late 60s that asked parents of uh, their sons or daughters were about to be married or in the process of dating or being married. And the survey asked the question, what is the one uh, choice or persuasion that if your son or daughter were to, to marry someone of this issue, what would be the number one issue that would cause you the most anguish as a parent? And you can imagine in 1968, the answer to that question was their son or daughter marrying someone of another race. And um, you can see the, the latent effects of that even to our day. So they asked the same question again in 20, I think it was last year, 2019. Mothers, uh, fathers and mothers for your sons and daughters, what's the one issue that if your child married someone of this other issue, what would cause you the most anguish? Uh, and it was not marrying someone of another race, it was marrying someone of another political party, as you might imagine, right? All the Thanksgivings and Christmases that are trickling down, right? Uh, and again, uh, we, we can be honest, I hope, and that there might be some deep-seated anguish of uh, political allegiances that even those of us in this room might disagree on, right? But it is worth noting that for Paul, uh, his anguish for the Galatians is not necessarily, primarily about where, how and where they voted, but it is how they have lost their first love in Jesus. Right? His anguish is over that. What Paul loses sleep over, what he feels what feels like a painful ulcer in his stomach, what is beating the kind of migraine in his mind, how his heart is being ripped open is how their affection for Jesus has cooled. And I, and I want to plead that we might wake up to be anguished by the kind of things that Paul is anguished by, the right kinds of things. I want to, I want to lose sleep over students of mine at Rice that are being lulled into false doctrine. I don't want to get caught up in all kinds of other very eternally insignificant things. I don't want to lose sleep over those anymore. I want to lose sleep over the kind of things that Paul is losing sleep over. Like, a, like an anguishing mother over children running away from Jesus. That's what I want to anguish over. And you can remember even Jesus, before he is taken to his crucifixion, he is standing outside Jerusalem. And what does he say? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I longed to have gathered you like a mother hen with her chicks. Jesus is anguished in that moment over the disparity in Jerusalem. He's anguished over the right kinds of things. And Paul has picked that up from Jesus. When was the last time that you almost were brought to tears and anguished over the condition of darkness or lostness of someone that you know? I think that's poking us in the right direction. The gospel does not make merely nice, emotionally neutral, passionless, Ben Stein from Ferris Bueller stay off characters of just saying Bueller, Bueller, right? That is not what the gospel does. If you remember, Paul goes from zealous, murderous, law zealot, and his zeal is transformed. It didn't disappear, right? It's transformed to a radical selfless, self-emptying, globe-trekking, self-denying, willing to take beatings on end, right? Over and over and over again, wanting to, as he said earlier in 1 Corinthians 9, that he might win all and he might share in the blessings, the joy, the life, the love of Christ, right? And if I had a single prayer for you is that God would grant Christ Church Kerrville that same kind of zeal and endurance that the gospel would so change the scope and the intensity of your relationship that people outside of this community would wonder and marvel at what God has done in you. That's what I would hope. It's not just that the, God, the gospel changes power uh, or even the intensity. There's no milk toast. There's no room for milk toast here, right? The gospel does change the motives. Lastly, do you see that? Look back at verse 13. Notice the contrast again between Paul and these false teachers. Paul says of them that they make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out so that you may make much of them. 
And the idea here is that there's this kind of Judaizer country club mentality, right? That they're trying to exclude you and, and while at the same time kind of flirting with you to pretend that uh, there's more joy to be had on the other side of this, right? If you'll only uh, come join us on the high life of this very exclusive club, this is where the, how the 1% Christians live, right? And Paul is pushing back against that, right? Think of how different Paul, Paul ends up in Galatia because of a bodily ailment. We, we don't know exactly what happened. He could have had some kind of eye condition. He could have had a very violent stomach virus, some commentators claim. Whatever the reason, he's not there courting them, kind of puffing them up with this nice uh, language to make them feel better about themselves, right? He has no pretension in his body. Timothy George notes that Paul would have stood out in stark contrast to the strong, good-looking super-apostles who boasted in their physical prowess, rhetorical eloquence, and academic achievements. The Galatians would have been tempted to reject Paul scornfully, right? He says that. You didn't despise or reject me. Assumes they probably could have had a reason to do that. The weakness and transparency in Paul's motives serves to authenticate the message of the real gospel, right? These other false teachers have all kinds of false motives. You don't really know where they are, who they are, what they're doing, or why they're doing it, right? Paul says, I was a mess in front of you, right? I was sick. I couldn't see. I wasn't there to make money. There's no greed. There's no exclusivity. There's radical inclusivity in Paul, right? Refreshing honesty and transparency, even in the midst of dire physical conditions, right? Again, our ministry is transparent. We echoed it this morning. While we were sinners... Christ died for us. So if the, if the gospel can change that, then we can walk out of here not needing false motives in the way that we secure any relationship, right? We can be honest with those around us, honest with ourselves, honest with our sin, honest with one another, right? Beautifully, refreshingly so. I think there's a, there's a case study, and this is where we'll finish this morning. I think there's a, a case study of a man that I've come to admire that uh, in our modern-ish era encapsulate these well. has become kind of a, a hero for me. Uh, you might be familiar with the name John Newton, who penned Amazing Grace that we all sing and love and know so well. And you may be familiar with some of his story, but I think it's, it's pertinent, especially given some of the backdrop of, of unrest that we see even in our own day. Uh, John Newton was very much involved in the African slave trade uh, for most of his early adolescent and even adult life. Even at the end of his life, after his conversion, and, uh, and he ended up pastoring a number of churches in England. He still referred to himself as the old African blasphemer, which I thought is something profound to hold on to that at the very end of his life. He, he was not fooling anyone, recognizing where the power had come from. When he was seven, his mother died, and his father, who was not a religious man at all, he was just kind of a seafaring captain, took John under his wing. And as you can imagine, from the age of 11 to 17, John, this very uh, precocious adolescent, gets thrown in the mix with the rugged sailor culture and community, right? Not necessarily known for <laughs> piety and religiosity. So he goes on a number of different trips and then comes back home. When he, even when he's at port and home, he's getting into trouble, right? He is becoming a, a footnote in the history of the stereotype of the teenager that rebels and runs away, right? That is his trajectory. At Christmas of 1744, he gets news that instead of going to uh, a one-year trip to the Mediterranean, he is now going to go on a five-year trip to the East Indies, okay? He's already logged five years of rugged seafaring. He's now about to sign up for another five years. And so uh, at the prospect of maybe his life taking a direction that he doesn't quite see, he, in the middle of the night before the ship sneaks off, he tries to escape and get out, right? <laughs> you can imagine... Uh, a party of Marines finds him out and about, recognizes him, brings him back in shackles to the ship, to the ship. And the captain of the ship has him uh, whipped and beaten with a cat of nine tails, not unlike Jesus, publicly flogged, right? So he is humiliated. His life is an absolute wreck at this point. He's probably 17, 18. He finds another one-year passage. He kind of somehow works his way out of that onto a ship bound for the Guinea coast. And uh, in the darkness of one of those nights, uh, a, sh a ship is uh, swirling back and forth, and he pens this. 
Though he, I was irrevo irrevocably lost to the faith, I picked up other shipboard reading material. He picks up Thomas Kempis's Imitation of Christ, kind of a Catholic devotional material, and begins to read it. The ship then uh, starts to sway back and forth in the middle of the night, and one of the guys that he is sleeping with is carried away and drowned immediately around him. So he thinks this is a God's judgment on a life that he has wasted, and he is going to die tonight just like the guy and his bunkmate uh, next to him. He said the storm did not recede, and he felt he would really soon meet his God. He finally at last clung to the scriptures that taught God's grace towards sinners, and he breathed his first weak prayer in years. And as he would later recall it, this was the famous phrase that you would all know the hour he first believed. After this episode, Newton never again goes back on his faith. He develops these habits of prayer, but a, a very interesting mark of him is humility, transparency. The gospel has changed the power in his life, the, the economic gain he thought he had. It's changed the scope and the intensity of his relationships, and it's changed the motives. He wrote this towards the end, what a poor creature I am in myself incapable of standing a single hour without continual fresh supplies of strength and grace from the fountainhead. The gospel has changed him, right? He says, let us chide our cold, unfeeling hearts and pray for a coal of fire from the heavenly altar to send us home in a flame of love to him who has loved us. The gospel's changed the intensity and the scope of his relationships. This is what is penned on his gravestone. You can go see it uh, in the north of England to this day. It says this. John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. That is exactly like the Apostle Paul. And your story does certainly not have to be as drastic or dire as John Newton's. But I do hope the gospel does the same thing to you as it did to him that it's, I hope, doing to me and to all of us, right? We know that Jesus, the most powerful being in the person of the Trinity, the second person, became powerless. That's also in 1 Corinthians 9. Born into obscure poverty, raised in anonymity, and crucified in weakness to secure real power for you on your behalf. We know that love and intensity in the relationships of the Father and Son and Spirit. We get a foretaste of that in this church community, this side of heaven, and we'll taste it more gloriously on the other side. But I hope that at least comes out of this morning that we would be uh, chastened, reminded, encouraged again that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation and can transform every relationship in your life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I am uh, grateful that you saved uh, libertines and infidels like us. We sang about it this morning. It is good to be reminded of what we were captive to. Uh, again, so that we can uh, become like Paul, captive again to your grace, to your kindness to us, that we would spend with all the energy you give us for however long we are on this side of heaven with all the energy and zeal you can give us to muster to demonstrate to an onlooking world here in Kerrville, uh, in, in Kerr County, in Houston, in Texas, and in the onlooking world, what real power looks like. The power of the gospel. That's all we want to see and delight and know with all of our energies, Jesus. And I pray that you would make it so. In your beautiful name, we pray all these things. Amen. Thankfully, the Lord uh, Jesus did not leave us with um, mere words, but gave us beautiful pictures and symbols. And uh, I haven't had the privilege yet of going uh, overseas, but one of the things I've heard from friends who have been in the catacombs in Rome is you can go down and you can, uh, Christians that were under intense persecution, time and time again, if you go in those catacombs and see profound mosaics, you will see two symbols resounding that they spent time and energy as families to want to remember. And it is baptism and the Lord's Supper. That those families that were uh, being ostensibly persecuted, what they wanted to remind the onlooking world is the promises of God and the covenants that he's given, uh, particularly through baptism and the Lord's Summer. So we get to graciously
partake of that again this morning, something that I don't have the privilege of back home, being online and virtual, and for those of us that are uh, displaced in parts of the world that don't get to come together and celebrate the Lord's Supper together. So this is indeed a privilege. There are some instructions that in a moment uh, we will invite you to come forward, and you'll notice that there are a numeral uh, various options for you. There are uh, a real wine and bread sealed in a cup. There is a gluten-free option, and there is a grape juice option. So please be mindful of that when you're going forward. We'll dismiss you by rows, and I think it's easiest for us if we can kind of cycle counterclockwise this direction. You guys can kind of come in and go out this way, and you guys might do the same in terms of movement, just so everybody uh, can be mindful of one another. We'll partake of the Lord's Supper together. So once you grab a cup, uh, come back to your seat, and we'll, uh, we'll take it together in a moment. And I just want, my last way of encouragement, uh, this is a family meal, right? This is for the people of God who have professed faith and who have admitted their weakness and acknowledgement of Jesus as their Savior. And if that's not you this morning, I'm really grateful that you're here. That was me for a long time. Um, and so I'm really grateful that you're here. I, I pray that you would use this time in solitude and reflection to consider maybe even something you've heard this morning. Uh, but for those of us that belong to the covenant family of God, this is a nourishing meal for you. Uh, there's a scene even when Jesus says that he won't partake of the fruit of the vine until he sees us again. There's almost this hint that Jesus is abstaining until we get to celebrate as a family together in heaven. That's a picture. To remember again <clears throat> that uh, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, just like this. And he, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Again, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy Father, creator of heaven and earth, it is truly right and our greatest joy to give thanks and praise to your glorious name. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. This is the blood of Christ, shed for you. Let's pray. Most gracious God, we praise you for what you have given and for what you have promised us here. 
You have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. You have fed us with the bread of life and renewed us for your service. Now we give ourselves to you, and we ask that our daily living may be part of your kingdom, and that our love may be your love, reaching out into the life of the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand and join in singing with us one more time. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other Church, receive this benediction. May the love of God the Father, may the grace of the Son, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and all for whom you care. Amen. Amen.